The scripture reading for today is from the 12th chapter of 1 Corinthians, verses 1 through 11. This may sound familiar because we often use it in church when celebrating people who offer their gifts of time and talent to serve in the church. Like last week when we commissioned those, including my husband Craig, who left yesterday morning for Guatemala. When St. Paul first wrote this to the church of Corinth, the church had big problems. Some people thought they were better Christians than others, claiming that they had greater gifts from the Spirit. Paul wants them to see that when it comes to spirit gifts, all are equal, and they are, not, are given not for one person's benefit, but for the common good. Everyone has a gift, so everyone can contribute to the good of the whole from the 12th chapter of 1 Corinthians. Now, concerning spirit gifts, brothers and sisters, I do not want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans, you were enticed and led astray to idols that you could not see and could not speak. Therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking by the Spirit of God ever says, let Jesus be cursed, and no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Now, there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit and those are varieties of services, but the same Lord and there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who activates them all and everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. To one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, and to another the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit. To another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by the one Spirit, to another working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another the discernment of spirits, to another various kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. All these are activated by, by the same Spirit, who allows to each one individually just as the Spirit chooses. Thanks be to God for these words of wisdom. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. My three-year-old was taking my blood pressure recently she had already listened to my heartbeat with her bright pink stethoscope, determined I had a fever, administered medication, and wrapped the invisible boo-boo on my left arm in an ace bandage. The, chuff, the cuff is child-sized and wouldn't make it around my bicep, so she took the reading from my wrist. This says what time it is. I corrected her. It's not a watch. It measures you know, your blood pressure. I mumbled something about your heartbeat and how healthy you are because I honestly can never remember actually what uh, blood pressure measures. Uh, <laughs> I always just ask the nurse if mine is like healthy enough. So Hattie adjusted her diagnosis. It says $65. <laughs> and it occurred to me in that moment that my preschooler thinks time and money are the only measures we have. We were just playing. That moment poignant perhaps more because of what it brought up for me than what it meant for her, but it still felt like a failure. She's only three, and the measures she knows are time, of which there is invariably too little of, and money. She's three, well, three and a half, which means she's a sponge. She absorbs everything. If she thinks there's only two measures in life, she got that from somewhere. One of the television networks is mounting a live broadcast of Rent on the 20th anniversary of the show next week, and so the most recognizable song from it, Seasons of Love, has been showing up in all of my feeds of late, because Big Brother Google knows me. You know that song? 500, 25,000, I'm not gonna sing it, 600 minutes, 525,000 moments so dear, how do you measure, measure a year? 
It's been in my head all week, in daylights, in sunsets, in midnights, and cups of coffee, in inches, in miles, in laughter, in strife. And finally, how about love? Measure your life in love. As Christians, as those who read the Apostle Paul in the chapter of his letter to the church in Corinth that follows today's reading, we may well know that of faith, hope, and love, these things all abide. But the greatest of these is love. Love, the love of God, the force that moves in the world, that reconciles us to God and neighbor, that's the one thing that Paul is willing to rank. He'll give pride of place to love, but only because everything else has to come from it. In this 12th chapter, though, that Marilyn just read, Paul hasn't gotten there yet. He's still wading through the conflict that threatens to tear this young congregation apart. The church is trying to organize its life, make priorities, figure out who has authority to make decisions and speak for God. Is it the one with wisdom or the ones with knowledge? Is it the ones with gifts for healing or miracle workers or those who speak in tongues? Who speaks for God? Who gets to decide what's important? How the community will make decisions? How their life together will be measured? Paul, and Paul gets knocked a lot because of some of the ways that he understands, roman or doesn't understand, romantic love, sex, bodies, and marriage. But Paul is brilliant here, de-escalating the conflict and teaching the congregation. Look. There are a variety of gifts, none by definition more important than another. Each and every one of you have gifts from the Spirit, and so you have to figure out how to value one another's gifts. There is one Spirit, many gifts, but one Spirit. If you fail to value the variety, you fail to value the Spirit. Now, that's all well and good, we might think, when it comes to the life of a congregation, but what about the real world? Church is about an hour on Sunday, right? Our life together, especially our public common life, requires that we measure things all the time. And love, or the degree to which the spirit is present, are too amorphous, not to mention too sectarian, to serve as a unit of measure a tool of public evaluation. How is that school doing? They have the most loving faculty and student body around. If you were online yesterday, though, you may have thought that it wouldn't be so bad for schools to have loving student bodies. Is that program effectively distributing resources to those in need? The Spirit of God is definitely present there. We nod our heads at Paul's words if we're the nodding sort, but it seems almost laughable to think that we can plan budgets and funding allocations this way, that we could measure success this way. One of the reasons we use time or money as measures is because they're easily agreed upon, inches and miles, weight and mass. These have common meanings, and they allow us to calculate information between units of measure. How far can you run in a minute? If we know time and speed, we can find out. Or with time and distance, we can calculate speed. We do a lot of this with sixth grade math right now at our house. For more complex information though, program efficacy or student learning, we have to develop better models, different measures. To know how schools are doing across the state or country or world, how much kids are learning, we develop different measures and tests. We took the CTBS test when I was in elementary school, and later ACTs and SATs and SAT2s and APs. Those tests were used to place us in tiered learning environments, and later to grant us access to college, and maybe even to gain scholarships and other funding. As the things we're measuring grow more complex, though, the more we have to pay attention to how well our measures are actually working. Even weight and time are relative and contextual. Weight on the moon is different than from on the earth. Time moves faster at greater altitudes. 
As we've come to that scientific awareness, it seems all the more striking that we don't see the same need to understand complex variables and contextual variations in other kinds of measures. We say things like, but what's the bottom line? We let money or test scores or whatever is currently law or practice become the arbiter of all things without stopping to ask if those are really the right measures or how whatever measure we're using might not accurately capture the, rea the realities of varied contexts without wondering how these measures or practices came to be in the first place or who benefits from them. I was born in September of 1979, which means I missed the societal ire for millennials by a scant three months. But I don't really feel like a Gen Xer either. Smells Like Teen Spirit played at our junior high dances, and while it was popular, we had insufficient angst to appreciate it like the older members of Gen X. So I prefer to think of myself as a member of the Oregon Trail generation. Do you know Oregon Trail? <laughs> it was a computer game that you could play on your classroom Apple II GS during recess on rainy days. We are those who were in elementary school in the 80s, and you will know us by our striking familiarity with ways of crossing a river and infectious diseases like dysentery and cholera. You will know us because if you ask any of us the definition to the words baloo, or Wuzzle, or Yonker, we can tell you. Do any of you know what a Baloo is? A Wuzzle? None of you took the CT basket. <laughs> so, uh, these words were a part of the written and spoken instructions at the beginning of the basic skills tests that scores of American kids took in the 1980s. The teacher would stand at the front and in giving the instructions would say, a Baloo is a bear. Wuzzle is to mix, a yonker is a young man. And I couldn't remember the name of the test, so I was Googling it and like all those words showed up on like all these sites. There is a, there is a generation of Americans who can tell you what these ridiculous words are. So these words were part of the instructions in these basic skills tests. Here's how the problem is set up. Here's how to fill in the bubbles on your Scantron sheet so that your answers will count. All you needed were ears to hear and a couple of sharpened number two pencils. Now, most standardized tests are taken on computers. Our kids up in District 64 take the PARC test, which is the Partnership for the Assessment of Readiness for College and Careers test although now it has a different name because they're rebranding. Because everyone seems to know that it's really not a very useful test. I don't know a single teacher who likes it, and everyone in our district at least will attest that the most reliable prediction it yields is that the school Wi-Fi will inevitably crash on the day that the test is administered. Students in our district, which is much like 181, if a bit bigger, take this test on their Chromebooks. Each kid on their own computer that comes home with them each night, that they use regularly. Schools throughout Illinois use the same test, ostensibly to measure college and career readiness, which is an important marker for third graders. Test results are used not only to evaluate individual student learning of how to take this test, but also to shape curricular choices and apparently to reveal data about teacher effect effectiveness. In some places, they're tied to school funding as well. If not enough of your kids do well on the park test, then you lose funding because you're failing. That seems kind of strange though, right? Whether one should tie standardized test results to evaluating teachers or schools has been a contentious suggestion since at least 2001 when the Elementary and Secondary Education Act, which was initially signed into law in the 60s as part of President Johnson's War on Poverty, was reauthorized as No Child Left Behind. But since the introduction of PARC, which is administered on computers, the meaning of these scores, the accuracy of their measurements, have been seriously questioned for a simple reason. The wide discrepancy in access to technology has been widening the achievement gap a gap that educators have been working for years to close. So hear this, standardized tests have always been problematic because people and schools and kids are not standardized. 
because we have had wide injustices in educational access for generations, exacerbated by redlining and white flight and the ways that we fund schools. There are a million variables that impact how well any individual does on a test on any given day, and just as many to explain the disparate scores between poor or minority students and those in wealthy, largely white districts. But the introduction of technology to the mix exacerbates the problem. The Washington Post reported on one North Baltimore school where some 450 students had to share 70 devices, which they could usually access only once a week. The principal noted that their lack of access made it difficult for them to develop the, school, the skills needed to succeed on an online test. It's not like those kids. Kids in poorer school districts who are disproportionately black and Latino have computers at home either. The digital divide is such that, as Jessica Schiller, who's a professor and researcher in urban education puts it, putting the test online just sets the city kids three steps back. It's more a measure of income than skill. So when Christians think about education then, which is what we are doing now in this series, Lord, teach us, as we are continuing to discern our way forward with the Before We Get to Mars project, we need to be asking questions about how we will measure success and what the ends, the goals of our work should be. We need to be asking questions about whether our measures are fair and about who benefits from our work. We also need to ask questions about whether we're limiting ourselves and our vision, not to mention the work of the spirit by too narrowly or too quickly focusing. We need to remember that there are many gifts and one spirit that moves in us all. Did you ever read Outliers, The Story of Success? It's one of, it was like one of Malcolm Gladwell's first books that really kind of like put him on the map as you know somebody who writes books with white covers in that particular font. It's Gladwell's look at a host of different and previously unexamined variables that provide opportunities to some and not others. So in one chapter, he profiles this guy, Lewis Terman, who ran longitudinal studies on a huge group of kids with IQs. He wanted to know how IQ was related to success. And those kids excelled in myriad ways, but in particular on a given IQ test which measured their ability to see and analyze patterns, to use abstract re reasoning. So tests like these, in which test takers sort through possible answers before converging on the right answer, measure something that's called convergent thinking. Terman invested years in this work studying his Termanites, uh -huh. but we know that some of his assumptions were wrong. There's a plateau, plateau at which IQ seems to stop mattering, a threshold which is like high enough to get you to success for the most part. Gladwell notes that extraordinary achievement is less about talent than it is about opportunity. And IQ, as it is frequently tested, is really only one measure of intelligence. And it's not all that terribly predictive of success. Another, perhaps more useful measure, looks at divergent thinking. So this one psychologist administered a test that measures divergent thinking to scores of British teenagers. And one sample question offers several nouns and asks respondents to list all the possible uses that they can come up with for a brick and a blanket. So Gladwell lists uh, the, the answers given by this one kid named Poole. Brick to use in smash and grab raids, to help hold a house together, to use in a game of Russian roulette if you want to keep fit at the same time, bricks at 10 paces, turn and throw, no ev evasive action allowed, to hold the aider down on a bed tie, a brick at each corner, as a breaker of empty Coke bottles, blanket, to use on a bed, as a cover, <laughs> that one's naughty, <laughs> as a tent, to make smoke signals with as a sail for a boat, cart, or sled, as a substitute for a towel, as a target for shooting practice for short-sighted people, as a thing to catch people jumping out of burning skyscrapers. So it's this long, funny, dramatic, creative, a little subversive, awfully long list. 
The response is from another student, a prodigy, the best student in the school, one of the highest IQs, are less so. Brick, building things, throwing. Blanket, keeping warm, smothering fire, tying to trees, and sleeping in. Improvised stretcher. Terman, Hudson, who administered this uh, divergent thinking test, and Gladwell all conclude that there's more to the story of success, of thriving, than intellect. Gladwell says opportunity is far more significant variable than we think. Tests that only measure one thing, tests that categorize kids and further cement social inequalities are at best limited in their usefulness and at worst dangerous in how they pigeonhole individuals and groups of students alike. There are a variety of gifts and one spirit that moves within us all. When we measure other people, when we measure ourselves and ask others to live up to our standards, we are often asking people to live up to standards or expectations of those with power or wealth. Those standards or expectations that have come from our experience and our values, but not others. If there are a variety of gifts, if everyone has a gift, we are called to listen to the voices of others in determining how we will measure what is good and true. Now it's true that we can't necessarily measure love, but we can measure what is fair and what is just. That we can measure. Martin Luther King wrote Power without love is reckless and abusive, and love without power is sentimental and anemic. Power at its best is love implementing the demands of justice, and justice at its best is power correcting everything that stands against love. On the front of our bulletin, we list things that are true about our community, things that we believe one of those is that we have power, and we use that power to make the world more like Jesus would have it to be. This is the work ahead of us then, as we continue to discern how we will serve God and God's people through education. What is the common good? How can we serve others? The poet Mary Oliver died this week and she asked through poetry pressing and wondrous questions. One of her most famous ends this way. Tell me, what is it you plan to do with your one wild and precious life? As we seek to live and serve, let us ask how it is that we measure the spirit of God in our lives and in our world. Amen.